Greetings, young scholars. Dr. Williams here for a, another exciting installment of international marketing from the text as shown on the slide, which the author's titled Chapter One, The Scope and Challenge of International Marketing. Now they wait until the very end of the chapter to kind of uh, share their opinion, but uh, I would direct you to it on page 24, where it says, the opinion of the authors that a study of foreign marketing environments, people, and cultures, and their influences on the total marketing process is of primary concern and is the most effective approach to a meaningful presentation. Our views are supported by the recent ranking of countries, the extent of globalization, where they point you to a chart uh, that we're going to reference later. But that's kind of where they're going to be coming from uh, in the text. <clears throat> so we'll notice some of that. I apologize for clearing my throat. That probably won't be the last one. Global commerce causes peace. This is akin to the argument that, uh, well, not the argument, it's backed up with data, that uh, trade amongst nations and countries and regions fosters peace because who wants to fight with their business partner? Right? We don't generally want to stir something up with a uh, large trading partner of ours, and they generally don't want to stir anything up with the large trading partner in the United States. So this slide references the, the end of the Cold War and the dissolution of the USSR. Uh, now the USSR is just without our satellite countries is uh, the Russian Federation, which is essentially Russia and whatever they've uh, invaded or tried to control or take over this week. Communist countries. Uh, in the 70s, Nixon, you know, one of his great, uh, President Nixon, one of his big accomplishments was opening China to uh, world trade. You know, as a communist country, it's eased since then, but it is certainly no, uh, you know, no Jeffersonian democracy. But because of the end of the Cold War and the Soviet satellite states and well, the Chinese opening it up, and you know, really, you only have North Korea left. This in that bundle. Uh, it uh, global commerce is much greater now than it was then. So then they go on to. I just kind of recap this already in uh, the first slide, but. Lack of consistent and predictable trade policies. You can actually put lack of consistent, predictable, insert the phrase, can lead to tension, all right? If you're not sure who's going to pay for lunch and they don't consistently do it, it can lead to tension if you're out to lunch with somebody. But world events <clears throat> affect trade for sure. Uh, company scandals, both in the U.S. and abroad, a war, or political unrest, where the president of the country has been killed or captured. Nobody knows where he or she is. Natural disasters. Uh, several years back, there was a big tsunami. Uh, I believe it was in Thailand. And uh, about a week after that, I called Dell Computer to uh, for a support call. And I got a fellow... Turned out he was in Evergreen, Alabama, which took me by surprise. And I said, well, you know, usually you get a you know, foreign agent uh, in a call center somewhere. And then he said that Dell had had to, you know, revert to U.S. support because of the, uh, the tsunami had wiped out all of their support centers in that area of the world. So, uh, that's more of a, on a service thing, but just as an example, uh, financial and economic disruptions, they give a couple of populist developments here. If you remember the uh, United Kingdom, 
uh, breaking out of the European Union with Brexit and just upending all the trade agreements that countries had had with the EU that included the UK and Britain. But uh, but then they don't exist anymore. So they have to all be re refigured. So now you have to have a trade agreement with the European Union and another one with the UK. And uh, then they list, the authors list Donald Trump as a populist being elected here. Uh, you've had Maduro uh, down in Latin America. Uh, and those things can affect, especially if you, if a company has some direct uh, foreign investment in a country uh, and the political structure is not stable and can't be counted upon, uh, then, you know, that could cause problems. Um, Subaru. Subaru is one of the, uh, for years, well, still is, even though they've changed the name, was one of the divisions of Fuji Heavy Industries out of Japan. And they had divisions and uh, bulldozers and all kinds of stuff. That five-star logo on a Subaru, if you can think about it. Wait, well, you don't have to think about it. Well, excuse me, it's six. On the front of this car, you can see those are actually the businesses that made up Fuji Heavy Industries. <clears throat> now, I had a, a friend who was an executive with Subaru, and he helped me out on several philanthropic uh, endeavors that I was raising money for uh, in Atlanta. And uh, because I appreciate it, I, uh, I bought a Subaru Tribeca. Uh, now, those, and now it's been replaced with a car called the Ascent, but leave that aside. Uh, are made in Indiana. Notice the logo up there. Subaru of Indiana Automotive. Red, white, and blue with a star in the A. Uh, that's a good example of uh, foreign direct investment from Subaru in, in Indiana, where they used to split a plant with a Suzu. I believe now they have it. Oh, but then they, they really claim that, uh, you know, they really push it, that the, the Subarus are made in Indiana, as American as, you know, Indiana basketball. So that's just something that came to mind as I was uh, preparing to lecture on, on chapter one. So the internationalization of U.S. business. So they state that globalization of markets, they increase more foreign customers, competitor suppliers, and competition that comes from both domestic and foreign firms. You can see some examples over here. I gave an example of uh, Subaru, uh, which is not mentioned here. Um, and you see all these uh, all these different companies here. Uh, BMW has a big uh, operation in South Carolina. And uh, 7-Eleven and Ben and & Jerry's. Well, I mean, what's more American than those? In fact, Ben & Jerry's is owned and operated by a couple of hippies up in Vermont, and I think they're milking the cows themselves. Uh, isn't that right? I will say, let me make this offer. I think the first five people that email me why what I said about Ben and Jerry's was said tongue in cheek, uh, which means that uh, I was having a little fun with that. Email me why, well, I'm telling you, people view Ben and Jerry's that way. Tell me, should they? And is that correct? I think you'll get two bonus points on the first exam. Uh, if you email me that. Uh, you can see some other examples right here. Holiday Inn from the UK. Huffy. Is that a Huffy? Which is one of the funniest lines from Talladega Nights. Uh, out of China, and of course, Wall Street Journal, Australia. Anyway, just some examples. One example, whenever I see it in the store, and they're in every convenience store, even uh, in rural, you know, Alabama and Georgia, are these bimbo snacks. You know, I always think, you know, is that not a classic example of 
a word meaning we know what bimbo means in English. Yet that's what they use uh, as a brand on their snacks, which I'm sure they thought through and decided maybe it was such a valuable brand that they stayed with it. But I always uh, find it humorous. And uh, the authors apparently didn't find it too humorous. But uh, as this Mexican brand is in the U.S. slide to have just as an example of what we're talking about. So American brands have a global reach and many international brands have a global reach too, but why? It's important for U.S. businesses to thrive. Some, yes, not all. Uh, you know, a landscape company in my hometown uh, may not have any uh, need for, you know, a global reach of their services because, you know, they can't, they're not going to branch off and, you know, landscape yards in Belgium. But as they buy materials and all their steel uh, chainsaws and stuff, well, those are international goods that they're buying. But uh, so it can be important. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, in many cases, foreign sales exceed domestic sales. <clears throat> True. I know that uh, I read recently a couple of banks who's um, international revenue was greater than their domestic revenue. Especially if you're in a smaller country with a smaller population and a smaller market than the U.S., which nearly everybody is. And uh, foreign investments generate a lot of revenue, and they use Apple as an example. Apple, which is helmed by a fellow named Tim Cook from Robertsdale, Alabama. That's true. You can fact check me on it. I always find that, uh, always find that an interesting nugget. So they, again, another slide with some uh, companies. You can see Apple in there. 60% of their revenues outside the US. Boeing, uh, Airbus builds, uh, constructs some uh, planes in Mobile, Alabama. And uh, that's a European company. They're not on here. You see, Walmart, uh, they've got global revenues, but most of it's in the U.S. And if you know anything about Walmart in Latin America, you know, they had some issues, which uh, I'm sure we'll talk about uh, later. Um, so you can see it's important. So the, the Premier Marketing Association uh, for marketers, both academics and practitioners, is the American Marketing Association, of which I'm a member, a dues-paying member. So I thought we'd start with their definition. The authors provide a definition, but you, sh you can always go to the mothership for marketing uh, definitions, ideas, and concepts, uh, and you never go wrong with the uh, American Marketing Association. Um so there, you can read their definition, the multinational process. If we leave out multinational, we say the process of planning and executing the conception, price, promotion, distribution of ideas, goods, and services to create exchanges that satisfy individual and organizational objectives. You know, they did more to the marketing definition than just insert multinational, but not a whole lot. Because the goal of marketing is to create an exchange. Uh, an exchange between you and I, let's say, to make it simple, that I have something that you are willing to buy, let's say, and so you're willing to give me some of the money that you have that you could spend on something else to acquire this thing that I have, a good or service. Uh, or sometimes, you know, people volunteer at the American Heart Association. What's the exchange there? They give up their time. And they get a good feeling about helping others. So there's all types of exchanges, which you learned about in principles of marketing. So that's the AMA uh, definition of international marketing. So the authors come in behind that plan, price, promote, direct flow of goods and services for profit. Right? That's what everybody's trying to do. So they're trying to do it for consumers or users in more than one nation. Our local landscape company is uh, 
they're trying to do that with a profit uh, in their hometown or county. Uh, and a business that's uh, applying to trade internationally or globally is a little bit different. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, they have a plan to do it in more than one place. It's different. They say unique, which means, you know, typically one of a kind. But uh, so I don't know that I would use the term unique, but it, I mean, it works. Uh, it's different than domestic marketing, of, you know, using the 4P marketing mix uh, for your own backyard. And uh, because working and selling, manufacturing and selling abroad has some different things that you can't control and that aren't as certain as here in the United States. In every country, our market uh, has their own set of factors because we're all different. Uh, We grow up different, differently. We're all multifarious individuals and we all have different cultural norms and things that we expect and things that we do. Um, So that is a large part of the international marketing task. This is a great chart. It's in the book. So you can, you know, see it on your own. Uh, It's on page 11. So if we start in the middle, which what they call, uh, you know, controllables, you've got the product place, price, promotion, and they add in research. So the four P's and research. You might have complete control over those, but let's call it complete control because it's very nearly complete control. And then within the domestic environment, think of this as the U.S. or the state where you are. Uh, You've got political and legal forces Uh, which generally you're familiar with. You're familiar with the structure of government in the United States and how a bill becomes a law and different things that uh, apply to the regulation for your business. Uh, The competitive structure, you know what that is in the United States. Uh, We can't uh, we can't start a uh, electrical utility because that's protected by the government to ensure. uh, You know, steady and reliable sources of electricity. Uh, but we can do just about anything else. And we can follow the economic climate, right? We can look at the stock market every day and we know what CEOs are leaving and certain reports have to be filed ahead of time. And uh, we know when people are leaving positions and uh, we know when there's somebody up for the Federal Reserve uh, Board and all those types of things. Moving into that third circle, now they've gone to the foreign environment. What do we know about the economic forces uh, that are affecting Finland. But if you're going to do business in Finland, you might should know that. What level of technology do they have? Would a uh, new, uh, I don't know, a a game or a device that required a lot of internet connectivity, would would that be, would you do well in a country that has very limited internet connectivity? Probably not. How things are distributed, the geography of it has ruined many an army and many a business because you're not prepared to get your stuff around. Or maybe there aren't roads and airports available like they are domestically to move your goods around. Cultural forces are tough uh, because we're of the concept we're going to come to in just a minute that we view, we tend to view things through our own uh, prism. Right, the way we were raised, whatever. So we're going to come to that in a minute. It's a good reason to have people on your team that aren't like you, especially if you're going to be doing, uh, you know, international business. And then political and legal forces. Generally, in the United States, we have a structure. We kind of know what's going to happen. Uh, here lately, it's been a little dicey, but uh, you know, uh, how does it operate in Chile or? Brazil. Well, again, if it's uh, four of us from, you know, Georgia or Alabama, uh, and we we might want to check into that before we take off. So what are some decision factors? In the in a domestic 
situation, you know, we worked a marketing mix and uh, we forecast the demand and we try to do it as efficiently and effectively as possible, right? So we can make money and uh, create some exchanges uh, that people think are of value. And we can alter uh, some things, you know, if uh, you see that Peloton is cutting back on their uh, production post pandemic because people aren't uh, locked up in their homes and apartments looking to exercise. Uh, so they're going to cut back on their production, maybe cut some overhead. They're going to, you know, changing market conditions, they're going to make some adjustments. Taste change you know, in clothing, in food. I mean, you know, 10 years ago, how many, you know, how many organic offerings were on the, your local grocery store shelf now? But, you know, Publix has a whole chain devoted to, uh, it's called GreenWise, devoted to those types of things. And uh, objectives. So we've got those decision factors. In a domestic environment, what can't we control? Well, a lot of things. But we can, if we stay on top of them, we can see them coming. And, uh, you know, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic was something that uh, came upon business very quickly. And it turned out creating some winners and losers. Some people didn't think about, I mean, you know, Netflix was a winner. Peloton was a winner. And, uh, and then there were, you know, losers. People were, you know, eating out less and making things at home and, Things like that. So in a domestic environment, we are generally pretty adept at uh, staying on top of those things. And we have these, some, a lot of these things are common with international marketing, right? That I just mentioned uh, before from that chart. Uh, you know, political, economic, and technology, culture. Where well, they're not completely controlled by the firm, but we can monitor them. We have some idea if we're good uh, modelers uh, to see where things are going. In a foreign environment, we have foreign environment, we have some similar set of uncontrollables, uh, but maybe we don't have that great understanding of it. Should we? Oh, absolutely. Uh, before you, you know, plunk down money and, and, uh, and effort, uh, and they're even more uncontrollable than uh, they are in the United States. If you just think it from a simple way, you can you can go and cast a vote for a government official that uh, you know agrees with you on some certain economic topic. Uh, and in another country, you know, where you're doing business, you can't even do that. So you may have to resort to other means, which people do, both legal and illegal. So they call, and I, as I said right at the beginning of this lecture, the authors refer to cultural adjustment, and they call it the most challenging and important task, which they do at the end of the chapter as well. And it kind of gives a tip that that's where they're going to concentrate uh, a lot of their efforts. So duties of international marketers. <clears throat> Interpret influence of each uncontrollable element on the market, right? Uh, adjust, and the most important one here, I'll say the most important, uh, a very important one, be aware of your own frame of reference when evaluating markets. And then they have a sub point here, often based off culturation and home country. So that leads us to the self-reference criterion and ethnocentrism. So, <clears throat> you know, the authors refer to this as a primary obstacle to international marketing success. And they, it is defines the unconscious reference to your own cultural values, experiences and knowledge, what I know. And if you couple that with ethnocentrism, that, that I believe the U S is the uh, best country in the world, the best ideas, and the U.S. culture is the best, our country is the best, and you know, I'll fight you over, um, then you can really create 
and have a lot of blind spots, which can be very expensive and also damaging to the business to the point that you could not have a business any longer. And then they mentioned at the bottom, most problematic when affluent countries work with less affluent countries. Well, that makes sense. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, when I go to the grocery store, I can pick from a hundred different types of toilet paper and milk and some third world country, you know, they can't even get food for everybody all the time. I'm thinking, well, why do I care how they do things? Well, you should research it. Maybe yours is the best way. Or maybe it's not. And you need to, you know, break out of some group think. And uh, maybe set your own point of view aside for a little bit. Everybody develops heuristics, which is a word you may be familiar with, maybe not. Think of it this way. It's a shortcut, right? We don't have to try every type of uh, chewing gum at the register at Target to before we buy one. Right. We've chewed one before and we like that one and we pick it up and we go. We've made a shortcut out of our past experience or some gum we've shared with somebody else. So <clears throat> everybody has those. When you're talking internationally and in international marketing, as we are here. Maybe those mental shortcuts you've developed uh, in the U.S. over a span of years. Uh, maybe those shortcuts don't work in an Asian environment that this is, this always works. This always doesn't, this is best. This is not. And then they mentioned these rule of thumb strategies, uh, short decision-making time, allow people to function without constantly stopping and think about their next course of action. Rule of thumb is a great phrase. I think maybe the first five people that emailed me, uh, the origins of rule of thumb. Uh, they might also get, I'm going to make a note of that, two bonus points on the first exam when it comes our way. So we've got Ben and Jerry's, and now we've got rule of thumb. All right, might be fun. Uh, so the first five, and I'll post who that is. So <clears throat> how do you develop a global awareness? Tolerance and willingness to learn about differences and some knowledge of history. Global, economic, social, and political trends. How do you get that knowledge? Well, you can read and teach it to yourself. I've always found, I like to do that, and I do that. I've always found that if you incorporate a group of people in decision-making that aren't exactly like you, <clears throat> That keeps you from making mistakes. It always has, uh, that's always worked for me. And, uh, you know, people that aren't from the same place and different gender and religion. And if you're talking about uh, doing some business internationally, maybe somebody from that target country that you're thinking of or hire somebody there to help you with it. So that's what the authors consider two main components of developing a global awareness. Main characteristics of companies that internationalize quickly, high technology or marketing-based resources, right? If it's a, um, if it's a technological service uh, that can be uh, downloaded and used over the internet, you could have customers all over the place, all over the world with the flip of a switch. Uh, companies that exist in smaller home markets, for example, I read recently that the GDP of the state of California is <clears throat> equivalent to, or maybe a little bit bigger than, the GDP of the whole country of Italy. So <clears throat> you're not going to reach Walmart status uh, just operating in Italy. Right? Just the math's not going to be there for you. Uh, or you have a, a home country that's... Um, maybe not very economically advanced, but you have huge production facilities there. So maybe you're making something to people in the home country you really can't afford much of, so you have it, so let's sell it. 
And uh, they generally have people who work there who are networked uh, internationally. So then we go to the stages of international marketing involvement, which you should be familiar with because I'm sure I'll be asking questions about it. Uh, it's page 21 and 22 of chapter one. So we've got, for example, no direct foreign marketing. My local, um, I don't know, insurance agent writing insurance policies on homes at the beach uh, in a certain area who's licensed only to do that in a certain area. They don't really have any direct foreign marketing. They really have no need for it. Uh, they might use international products, right? They might write policies from Lloyd's of London or something. Uh, so those people aren't generally uh, interested in it, and uh, they may sell to other companies, and they sell it internationally or whatever, but, but they don't actively cultivate customers outside of maybe their state boundary or county boundary or certainly the country boundary. Infrequent foreign marketing. That's that's typically, let's use an example, uh, the company's making, you know, widgets uh, or product A, and they've made too much, and they need to get rid of it. Uh, so, and they've, you know, they've, in the U.S., say the economy is really down on, uh, you know, product A. People aren't buying it anymore. But in some, another country, people have just gotten tuned to it, and they're buying it, Right. So that would be some infrequent foreign marketing. Let's say you had a surplus, you were looking to move it. Then you move down to the area where the book's going to concentrate regular foreign marketing. So the primary focus of this type of operation would be to service domestic market needs, like U.S. to market needs, U.S. market needs or uh, estate needs. However, they see a demand picking up overseas. They may, uh, you know, devote part of their production line for uh, foreign markets. Maybe they have to make a couple of changes to it so it'll work when they plug it in in Italy or Finland or something like that. So they may take 10% of their uh, production line and say, Whoop, this is dedicated towards selling <clears throat> outside of uh, the U.S. And they would do some, that's, what the authors categorize under as an example of something that would be under regular foreign marketing. International marketing, those are companies that are, they're all in. And uh, they're looking for markets all over the world. And they plan uh, production for markets all over the world. And uh, that's just the way they do business. And then at the top of that pyramid, which is not a pyramid, it's just a list. So it'd be the bottom of this list, but the most involved uh, would be a company that uh, operates as if the world is just one market, no matter where they're based. So they base, they, they make a product, let's say, you know, uh, their home office is in Atlanta, Georgia. But they view the whole world, let's say Coca-Cola, they view the whole world as their um, market. Coke's probably not a great example of that, but because they but they do have, uh, you know, we're all familiar with the domestic brands, Coca-Cola, I mean, but they have a whole suite of brands that they develop and sell only in other countries. Uh and I used to have a neighbor that was an executive at Coca-Cola, and every Christmas he would have a party, and he would have nothing but Coca-Cola offerings that were not available in the United States, all sorts of drinks. Then you could ask him, you know, and carry on. He would say, yeah, this is an Israeli version of this or a Brazilian version of that. It's pretty good. Think of Nestle. You can buy Nestle bottled water in most any convenience store anywhere. Uh, Nestle has a headquarters, but they're not really uh, – they don't. They don't advertise that they're a uh, that they're a company for their home country. Nestle is a multinational company doing all sorts of things, and the world, uh, you know, is their playground. So 
what's the extent of globalization for different countries? They use this uh, KOF globalization index, and they put they have the top ten, and then they have some other selected ones based on. Uh, this is a uh, that uh, dinging is on my nerves. Apologize for that, but you can see. You know, for one thing, we have some pretty small countries here per capita in the top 10. No big population uh, countries. So obviously, if you have a, you know, they're going to do a lot of international business because there's just, you know, once you tap out Austria, you know, you haven't maybe not done a lot. You're looking to get somewhere else. You see, the United States is 27. We have China down here at 71. So you can see they they measure, <clears throat> excuse me, three measurements, politics, political, environment, social includes, you can see the internet and uh, tourism, things like that. And then the economy, you know, how open is the economy in this kind of ugly green uh, bar. So it's just kind of a way if you're looking to kind of quantify how a country is equipped uh, for globalization, <clears throat> you can, uh, this is one measure, it's pretty handy, uh, and it changes all the time, all right? Uh, Turkey is having, uh, well, I don't know what happened there, but it went away. But anyway, that's a, a good chart, and it's in the book on page uh, 25, and you can also see an updated uh, version if you just uh, Google it. This is from 2018. Be interesting to see uh, the differences in the top 10 and then these uh, these next ones. So with that said, that concludes uh, chapter one. And uh, thank you for your attention. And I will see you again very soon on the 